Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Uh, we're a little late today. I apologize. You can blame a lot of different issues. I'm not going to go through it all. I'm just going to say I'm sorry. Technical issues are crazy. But we're here. And so none of them are my fault. None of them. None of them were Tom's fault, to be clear. Uh, it is all 100% my fault. Oh, so we will, I will take 100% of the blame. But as you can see, Tom is here, uh, as always. So hello, Tom. Hello, friends. There you go. Also joining us, very excited to have him back on the show and very, very excited to be talking about what we're talking about tonight. It's Adam Smasher. It's Uncle Adam from Tabletop Minions. How are you doing, sir? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you for having me. You've got a lot of different nicknames. I, I do. Like, I, I do. I <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine with it, frankly. Um, you know, I... I, I uh... You just just don't call me late for dinner, I guess. <laughs> sure, absolutely. I you know I use that joke, and I feel like I'm I'm like some 1950s dad, but I, yeah, same I like here. That joke. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's what I say too. All right. So uh, let's get into it. I think we've got some news to start with. So uh, why don't we start there, Tom? What do we got? Uh, some may be an overstatement for the uh, for the evening. It's a scant, um, it's a scant news week. We have a scant news week. Um, uh, given Vince's traveling, um, I will do the sharing for the images. So we have a rumor engine that has popped up, and it's a rope or a cable, but it's probably a rope. a rope. I think it's a rope. The way that it's fraying, I think it's a rope. Yep. This so is I, I know what I think this is. What, 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 what do you all think it is? It's undead. You think it's undead? Yep. 100%. Could be a really, really weird... Uh, uh, it could be a Twizzler. It's a good point. You know, could be somebody apart. unwrapping a Twizzler. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good... Uh, a new candy force. You never know. Like, we haven't really talked about all the Mortal Realms, so maybe there's, like, a candy Mortal Realms, you know, like Gumdrop Mountains, that kind of thing. Yeah. I kind of assumed there was, actually. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Like I would say that's ones. probably in the realm of uh, the realm of sugar, the the lost ninth wind of magic. Mm -hmm. That's not the realm of death. Um, it's the most delicious of <laughs> the winds. <laughs> Indeed, uh, I I'm gonna go with Grotz. <laughs> what is this? Just a you project whatever you want onto it? No, no. Right so you know, as somebody had pointed out, like oftentimes when amongst the GW models, Grotz are where the physical humor is. Um, and this, the, the, this is the type of thing I would expect to find in a grot kit, whether it's like a squig pulling against, um, uh, you know, tie downs, whether it is a, whether this is like an, uh, a airship, like a, a rusted out hull sky, sky pirate ship with like one of this being the tie downs for the balloon or whatever, like okay. this like it smacks of grots to me is what I would it, say. It is poorly maintained, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which I yeah, can see I mean, is death. Like I can see you going with death, obviously, because it is yes. poorly maintained. Well, but, but grots are not known for their, you know, OSHA compliance either. So yeah, I suppose. That's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> but I'm going grots. Well, so let me ask this question, okay? Okay. I think this is like a hangman's thing out of the new like out of the coming death stuff. All right. Okay. So like, I think to me, it just reads like part of the same release where we'll get the black coach and the purple sun and all that kind of crap. That's why it's not. Uh, okay. I know that like you, when it's super obvious, I know you're always like, Oh, they're tricking us. And uh, often they are like, remember. So you remember the, the, like the, the thing that everybody's like, Oh, these are the sky dwarves. And we still don't have that reveal yet. And now we or think it's the like thing that form. looked like elf hair that was actually like the uh, custodes top the knot. The custodes, sure. yeah, the top knot, exactly. Um, and like we knew elves were coming, everybody's like, "Oh, it's elf hair," and it's like, "No, no, actually, it's not." Sure. This could be more yeah, deep, fun. deepkin shenanigans. This could be like a you know rotted boat rope thing, you know. Yeah, it could be a terrain piece like that. I would totally buy. Like yeah, another I'm element. Rain piece, yeah. Yeah, like one of the like the mystical vortexes or whatever the new like generic term is for the terrain pieces that uh, the deep can can lay on the table. We know that potentially those are coming from the rule book, so maybe. 
So, all right. Well, but let me ask this question. Okay. All right. Wouldn't this be a cool concept for like a hangman thing? Like this is a thing in um, like both Malifaux and a couple other games have played with this where you, they have like models that have been hung, hanged. I don't know, whatever the past tense is there, right? Or something, but you've got like the, the fraying ropes and things like that of, of somebody who has been hung. Like that's a cool concept. This guy could see this as that. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I hear you. Uh, I'm going to say no. I think all it's right. cross. Okay. <laughs> I'm going stick, to stick to my guns here. Um, that's fine. Well, let me ask. So I want to flip a question over to Adam here too. Adam, I know you're, you're a death fan. You're, you're a mm-hmm. fan of death. Mm-hmm. True. So if we get, you know, some kind of new night haunt focused death release, new black coach style thing, is that something you'd be excited about? Are you looking for, or do you want to expand your death or are you still trying to crawl through everything off the Nagash book? Well, no, I am. I would like to probably, because the thing is, is that like, I, I like the skeleton stuff a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not super into the zombies. I'm not super into a lot of that. So I'm, I'm more into the skeleton stuff. Um, you know, Terrorgeist, but I'll also do, like, I've got Vargeists that are finished. I've got, um, I've got Hex Wraiths, which are built and textured and everything and just ready for priming. So if it was something a little bit more skeleton-y, a little bit less, you know, uh, tomb... Fleshy. Uh, yeah, a little bit less fleshy, a little bit less flesh eatery, a little bit less of that, uh, I would be pretty fine with it because I would like to kind of spread out I think that death is probably one of the hardest armies to go, um, not faction pure. Well, kind of, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you know, like it's, if you go, well, I think it's really difficult. It's super difficult for me to go super pure on any, um, on any age of Sigma army. Cause I constantly just be like, Oh, but I can add these guys too. You know I mean? Like my chaos sure. army is the definition of soup. Cause it's like, you know, it's Nurgle stuff, but it's also Slaves of Darkness stuff. It's also Beastmen. It's also Skaven, you know, because I just, I mean, I'm working on uh, actually the um, Storm Fiends right now uh, just because I found them recently uh, a good deal and they're just super fun. Although this guy's like 25, 30 pieces, which is a little overkill. So, you know, there's that. So, yeah, I, I would definitely, um, I bought the the war scry citadel because i was like well the heck this is awesome and i've also got the not the garden of more but the other one um the smaller version of it the you know the mausoleums and all that stuff so a little bit more terrain that'd be cool but if it was like a bigger thing i don't really like the mortis engine too much so if it was like a bigger more skeleton focused kind of like war engine i'd be all for it hmm. if it's grats i'm probably not all right about it <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Look, nobody actually wants goblins. Don't don't listen to Tom. Nobody wants that. You are for, out of your damn mind. <laughs> they Tom will sell Paul. That's it. Those are the two. If if this <laughs> ends up being grots, like they are going to sell so many boxes. Like especially if it's like sky grots, you know, like airship, like ragtag, ramshackle, tinkerer grots. They're gonna sell. Um, a lot because that's something that they haven't explored. Like goblin bomb grots. Yeah. Why don't we just make them water grots and they can hang out with the the non fishmen? <laughs> well, speaking of non fishmen, that's mm-hmm. a gr- great segue there. We're in the middle of that uh, deep can release. Um, I got my book here and have been pouring over it. Um, I mean, not a lot more than we, I mean, we did a show on Wednesday night mm-hmm. or on uh, Monday night and not still not sold on them, but they're still coming. They're great models. Um, I, uh, I've been very impressed with, uh, the, like, the, the, like, again, the, the poses, like the, the plastic that GW is just putting out is off the hook. Um, it doesn't matter that I'm not going to play the army probably ever. <laughs> so, um, but we're in the middle of that release cycle. We'll have another set of releases dropping this weekend. That'll be exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one more after that, too. We're still not done. One, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're really stretching this one out. I believe art pieces are coming with the pre-orders. Like, if you pre-order from GW, they're sending out, like, custom art pieces over the four weeks. Yeah. Um, so, for those that don't know and, and are wanting to collect all things uh, Deepkin, you may want to at least get... I think it's maybe, like, orders of 50 or more. It may not be that much, but it, I think it is. And if so, like you may want to, you know, order a box from GW or whatever. 
just to be able to secure those. Um, what else? Uh, and then the other news piece that I noticed this week is that Forge World announced that their skull cracker mold has broken. So for the Chaos Dwarves, like the 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 war machine that had like the arms, the really spi- spiky war machine for Chaos Dwarves, uh, that has now that has now come to an end, and they are not planning on restoring it or uh, putting the model back up. It's so funny that that could happen. Yeah, I mean, it's like I, I I saw that news article, and it was the funniest thing because they're like, "Yeah, the skull cracker mold degraded. That's it. It's done." And they're like, "We're not gonna spend the huge amount of money to redo it." So, okay. But wait, this is this is Forge World, right? It is. Yeah. So I I don't even know if it'd be that expensive because assumingly it would have been a resin model, it, not a yeah, exactly. Plastic. If it was a plastic so model and you're talking about mold. steel, then yeah, that's a very expensive mold. But if it's resin, yeah. like half the time when you get pieces of resin from either Forge World or Finecast, it's got pieces of the mold stuck to it still. So you know that they're running, you know, that they have to make a lot of those. I don't know. That's That seems, I think they just don't want to make it anymore. That's what it sounds like to me. It could be. I mean, it seems to me like that thing was probably a nightmare anyways to begin with. I mean, if you've ever oh. seen it, it's like this finicky piece with all these little weird hokey arms and tiny bits like... In mm-hmm. resin, that thing has to be an absolute nightmare to actually craft. Like, I can only imagine how many failed ones. I had an unassembled one. one. And they couldn't put in a box. I had an unassembled one, and I looked at it and was like, mm, I really don't want to make this army. Like, there's just so many pieces. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like in, in all of the sub-assemblies that I would have had to have done to, to paint that appropriately, like, it, nope. I looked at it, and it was like, mm, I don't want to paint this that badly. Mm-hmm. Sure. No. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I mean, get you it. know, we kind of blew past this. We kind of blew past this, but I want to go back because Adam said something that I want to drill in on here. I, I want to get his opinion on the show here. So, Adam, I, and I've kind of heard you talk about this a little. What What are your thoughts on the Deepkin so far that you've seen? Like, what what do you what do you think about the army? The 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 wet elves, you mean? Um, elves, yeah, sea elves. elves. Yeah, no, S- well, smells. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I just it's. I mean, it's not my aesthetic. I mean, they're they're technologically um, amazing models. Obviously, uh, I've got what did they send me? I've got um, Volturnos, the high oh, yeah, sure. so and so of the deep, and I've got some of the Namarti thralls as well. And so, I mean, they're really good models. Don't get me wrong; they're well done. Um, it's just not my visual aesthetic. I'm not a big elf fan in general. Um, and I lastly was really hoping for, you know, like scaly bug eyed, um, you know, sea folk of some fashion. Um, so, you know, there's that. It's also very interesting the way that they're kind of like saying, oh, well, when you're fighting against them, they've brought some of the sea with them. And so there's a whole thing with that and everything. And I'm like, all right, well, that's, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of the only group that does that that I know of that kind of brings part of their realm sort of with them. And so that, I don't know if that's something they're going to start doing more of down the road. Um, Sylvaneth, I mean, I'd like to disagree with you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Sylvaneth can pop up some trees all over. I've got a, a good friend who's a Sylvaneth player, and I have had to dodge those trees before. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I get that. But, I mean... It's yeah, it's an interesting thing, and I know a lot of people seem very interested in. I mean, in the models for like the like the turtle and the, all those things are are pretty cool looking, um, but yeah, it's not particularly my cup of tea, I guess. No, I get that, and it's it's an interesting like. It's funny because I think if they had actually made fishmen, right, there would have mm-hmm. been a group of people who were like, "This is stupid. We hate fishmen." It would have been a group of people who loved them. Like, there was no one winner with this. Right? No, that's true, um, certainly. I, I personally would have loved merfolk. Like, true merfolk, right? Like, not, not, like, you're talking about fish people, and I'm talking, like, my, see, my, the thing that would have hit with me would be, like, merfolk, like, fishy tails, you yeah. know, aerial type of stuff, blue skin, true. like, magic card merfolk, right? That would have been the one where I'm like, whoa, now you've got my attention. So that's just it. There's so many ways they could go with this. Right, and I doubt we're going to return to the sea anytime soon. Like, I don't think we're getting a second ocean army. Well, I don't in the know. Next year, or well, two. obviously, the lore book talks about them. 
uh, it talks about two additional armies that 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 swim even in the deeper depths in the lore. Like they talk about them, not the Merwim, but the Mer something. Like it's something related to the Merwim language, like the Forge World monster. Yeah. But they changed it enough to like it's a people, it's a race. Um, and so those are probably your more scaly, whatever those are going to be. Those are your more monstrous, scaly folks. Um, and they already have the mechanics in place. So releasing another sea army, you know, a couple, you know, two years down the road would not be out of the question if this is a real big seller. Do you think that, uh, like they did with the Caradon Overlords, do you think that, like the Caradon Overlords, they dumped a, a, like a lot of stuff all at once and then it's been real quiet? Do you think that that is completely based off of sales where they don't push any more stuff if it's not selling that well? Or is it just a kind of a set it and forget it? We put the stuff out and then maybe in a couple of years we'll come back to it? Or I, I don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, I think, they, I think it's very much a set it and forget Michael. it thing. I really yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they release a book and in that book they have an envision the X number of units. And then if they decide they're going to release another book, they're going to do so most armies aren't going to get the Stormcast treatment. And what I mean sure. by that, like the Stormcast getting that one-off model, that, you know, that one-off Celestin or whatever, or that... Like he repeatedly it. over and over, over the course of, yeah, right. since, since like, the original release, yeah. Right, we haven't seen that. The, no other army has gotten that treatment. Everyone else gets a single release with a book and everything else that floods that follows. Um, and so, like, I can imagine a world where in a year or two, we may see another Iron Jaws book. You know, like if if they want to expand that product range or more likely it would be some grot range that supplements the Iron Jaws that expands it, you know, that they that they can sell it all as kind of one package the big wall or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so they would they could come back to these, but I don't see them doing that. Like, I, well, ultimately, here's my hope. Yeah. Like what we've really done with the mortal realms is expand the sort of field of play. Yeah. Right. And what I mean by that is like traditional armies had traditional homes and traditional setups and fought on traditional battlegrounds. Right. But when we entered the mortal realms, like we, we had license to throw all that out the window. If we needed to, you still need some armies that look like people and act like people and live in buildings and, and you feel grounded too. Right. And, but we have a lot of those, so that's fine. But like, even in the, uh, the KO book, there are other people who live up in the skies with them, right? In yep. this sea book, there are other people who live down in the oceans. Like, we can start playing around with, with that over years, right? It doesn't have to be quick. Sure. Like two years from now, you could see another sky army. You could see another sea army of a different race. Like, we can start expanding into those territories, and that's what I hope they do, right? right? I don't think... I mean, I think it's a long cycle before you'd see, like, more stuff for KO or more or something like that. Like, I don't know if that would ever happen or how... I, Anything's possible on a long enough timeline. Well, see, that's what I would like. I think they just pushed out into that space. You know yeah. what I mean? That's what's kind of weird to me, I guess, as a person who's also played a bunch of 40K, is that like 40K, you have these main forces, and like they haven't really put out a, a new 40K force in a long time. You know, they put out new stuff for a lot of those armies. And that's what, to me, I would just think that down the road in two years, if they wanted to go back and start doing more sky stuff, that they would do more Caradon Overlords. Or if they wanted to do more sea stuff, they would maybe, I mean, at the very least, they would have to make them, I would assume, well, they wouldn't have to, but you would think that they would make them allied just so that you can build a bigger army. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And I and I wouldn't put it beyond them to release another KO, a revised KO book, even you know, because like they've I've heard from the playtesters, I've heard like they GW themselves, we've talked to folks, like they recognize that like not everything is right. You know, like that was on the cusp of the new design. Mm -hmm. I mean, the new design that you saw from um on a in a lot of different elements. Like, for example, we're gonna get a new Stormcast book. We are, even though they said we're not going to get another one for a long time, um, and it's been a year. Um, but you know, when That's they start special edition, which isn't a long time for Stormcast. Um, but what I would say is that, like, because Stormcast are poised to be updated with this enclave rule, you know, like the enclaves, the the temples, the all of that tech that we now have that wasn't in the prior right. books, like that is made for storm hosts. Like, you know, for the individual Stormos and the distinctive character of those things, 
Um, what was once Mega Battalions, they fixed that with the new tech of these on the Enclave Temple uh, Skyport stuff. Um, and so, like, we're going to get a new uh, Stormcast book in that vein. I could see them, as the tech kind of evolves in the game design, I can see them revisiting certain things. And they're going to do some of it, obviously, through the General's Handbook. They've done that. We saw kind of the patch for Iron Jaws in General's Handbook. Fire Slayers, the patch was in General's Handbook. Mm -hmm. All of those are initial armies that got battle tomes early, they were fixed in General's Handbook. I could see them continue to do some of that to kind of bring bring things up to speed, including adding battalions there um, and maybe even doing allied battalion stuff. Like they haven't done a lot of that. It's been in some of the books. Like I think about in the newest Deepkin, they have like the the elite, the like, what is, what is it called? Like the earth and sea or what, whatever the, like the forest and the, the deep can yeah, like yeah. Deep can allegiance. I could see them doing more of that. I could see them doing like a doored and a mixed doored and where they're going to bring in dispossessed with KO and stuff. And, and you will revolutionize and renew those armies just by being able to integrate them into those allegiances. Mm -hmm. So I could see them doing more of that, especially in that general handbook space, but we'll see. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean at the same time, by the way, there's also no reason if you did introduce another like sky race. Let's say let's say it was your classic like sky orcs that they talked about in there. Okay. Um, they could go a direction where the sky orcs and the Kradron overlords can ally even though they're cross alliance. Like they could break that rule apart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you could say, like, within the span of the alliance, these guys, whenever you bring them over, they as allies, they count as now this other alliance. Yeah, they gain the order right. people, or they gain the destruction. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that, and all of a sudden, things go really like that. Suddenly, expands a whole world. So they could do a dark sea race, and you know, have like the Edeneth already have a dark edge to them, right? So it wouldn't right. be that much to think that some other pretty dark race down there that they can ally with. If so, they can either lean toward order, their normal disposition, but there's some bad deepkin who go and join the evil underwater sea people. They hang out with Ursula. And, you know, that's not good for them. So, there you go. well, uh, and even in the most recent uh, Deepkin article that they released, they talk about Vortinos, like the leader, like the box that you have. Yeah, Volter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's not Deepkin. Like, I don't know if you realize that or not. He is the last of the that initial race of elves. Like, he is truly the last one that has had to prove himself amongst the Deepkin. But he himself is not Deepkin in the lore. He's just been um, holding his breath. Well, no, he like he's just <laughs> magical or something. Um. But but what they make clear is that like he has his own plots and plans, and that it, it, there seems to be some implication that he like it says like in the one article it was something along the lines of uh, you know only time will tell what his plots are and if he'll stay with his allegiance or not or something like that dot 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 and so there's some allusion sure. to like he has alternative plans you know um, which we could see the first major jump you know of like name characters and stuff like that you know? so who knows we'll see. All right, cool. Um, but that's all I really have for news. I mean, it was it's a quiet week. No, that's fine. All right, so let's talk about some pick of the week. So, Adam, uh, why don't you start us off there, sir? What would you like to share with everybody? Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, I've been uh, really enjoying uh, the the stuff that I've been seeing lately on the the Warhammer community site and when they've been just, I don't know. I, I think it's, I feel like as if there's been like a tonal shift a little bit over the last couple of months, mm -hmm. which I, I don't know, as a person who's kind of got a, who's got a background in marketing, I've been kind of enjoying kind of just watching this experiment. That's the, uh, the Warhammer community site and how it's changed since its launch, which is what, like a year now at this point, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think there's been there's been that that I've been noticing, um, but yeah. Otherwise, I uh, have been really really enjoying uh, Shadespire a lot lately. I just picked up the two new um, warbands, the Vanguards and the new Armored Corn dudes, and uh, I'm gonna put them on the pile with all the other ones. And because I've got my or my orcs are built. So my the two the two forces that came in the box they're done painted I've been playing with them I like the stormcast quite a bit um, and I'm going to be doing orcs next after those two and I've just got to get that time together because I've been working on all these other things including 
uh, my storm fiends and stuff like that. So, but these, the, I can understand a lot of people were like, Hey, uh, you know, you guys could do something else other than just storm casting corn. And I agree. I would really love to see Seraphon, uh, Warband, just because I've never painted Lizardmen before, and I would love to do so. The reason that the orcs are the next on my on my uh, list is because I've never painted orcs before, so I'm really looking forward to just only doing four. That's a big deal. Um, but yeah, uh, we're gonna actually Saturday is International Tabletop Day, and uh, me and the guys from work we're gonna be running kind of a Stormcast demo slash casual event at our local shop. On Saturday and uh, and and having a good time with that. So um, that's I think probably yeah. I I've been really enjoying. I've been just I, the the thing about Warhammer community was just something I was thinking about recently. How just kind of how things have changed a bit and how I'm enjoying that. But really, it's it's the new Stormcast or the new uh, Shadespire stuff. I'm I'm really glad that they're that it's doing as well as it's doing and that they're pushing it in the way they're pushing it. Yeah, I I agree. Like. Um... That orc crew, by the way, or warband, whatever you want to call them, is uh, is pretty great to paint up. I just finished mine recently. Yeah, um, they really are awesome models. Like I, I was, I, I like everything in the Iron Jaws range. Obviously, I think they're all fantastic models. But that crew is really well designed. Each one of them has a really nice personality, which mm -hmm. is what you can get. Like that's why I think one of the things that, um, that like I really have to respect is that, like, they really, with these war bands, they've done a good job of making it so each one of the members has, like, a real personality that comes through in the models, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, 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 I, I get that. So have, what have you, what uh, what of them have you already painted? There you go. That's the question I'm trying to ask. The the two base ones from the main starter box um, are, are, I because they, GW sent me the starter box a good deal earlier than before it came out uh and and i got it and like on a friday and i'm like well i know i want my next video to be about this so i had to get them painted up but before thursday you know the next week but i knew also that i had at least a couple of nights that week that i wasn't gonna be able to paint because of other obligations and stuff so i had to kind of fast paint them and, and they turned out pretty well i'm i'm i'm, ha I'm mostly happy with them i would love to almost kind of go back and like I almost wish that they would sell them separately, but there'd be no reason, obviously, for them to do so. Right. Um, but I would like to kind of take another pass at them. I mean, if I really wanted to, I could either just buy the starter box again for reasons, or I could strip them and then go from there. But we'll see. Um, you could also like secondary market them if you really I want. Saying, like I know. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's true too. That's a good point. But, but, but people could use them for AOS. Like, so there is technically a market, even though as small as it would be. Yeah. Um, no, that's true. I th again, I think that's a really smart thing too that they did was by making the the war scrolls for each of the war bands and making it so that it's for the entire war band that it's not just like oh this guy is like a random hero now that you can throw into your group. It's like no, these guys have to kind of go together and here's the, the the information for it. I think that was really smart on their part as well. So um, part of what we're doing uh, on Saturday is we're going to be you know showing like I've been having people contact me a little bit locally through the 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 Game Four app. And I've been um, and you know, asking like, hey, you want to play Age of Sigmar and stuff like that? Because I made a looking for players, you know, thing on the app. And so I've told those people in the messaging recently, I'm like, hey, if you haven't tried out Shadespire, come on down on Saturday. We're going to be running it and I'll give you a demo and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's that. I think that's going to be fun. Did you end up giving away Sam's uh, sepulchral crew that he painted? Yes, I did. And as a matter of, oh, that's right. I, the, the, um, you've just reminded me, the guy sent me a picture and I've just never bothered to post it like a doofus. Uh, uh, but I need to do that. Yeah, no, um, I did send it to, uh, someone, um, in America. So shipping was not as crazy as it was. I gave stuff away back when I hit 10,000 subscribers a long time ago. And it's like every one of the, like, well, one of them was, I think to Alaska, but everything else was like, you know, way overseas. So it was, um, the shipping was crazy, but this one was, was relatively inexpensive, but yeah, that, that, that painted set was also really, uh, pretty awesome. I'm going to be actually shooting more stuff with Sam on the 5th of May. And then those videos will come out sometime after that, but we're going to be shooting in the new studio. So I'm, um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I don't think we're doing any Shadespire, but he did just recently paint up some, uh, Shadespire, the, the, the dwarves 
for a friend of ours. Um, I saw. They look great. Yeah, yeah they, they really did. I um, actually played against them on Sunday last week. Uh, we had a three-player game, which I strangely won, but just barely. <laughs> strangely won. I like how you phrase that. Yeah, like it does Which is a total mystery. It doesn't happen frequently, me winning in any kind of tabletop game, but this time I, uh, I squeaked one out, so that was good. <laughs> nice. All right, Tommy, what about you? What's your pick of the week, buddy? Uh, friend of the show, Stone Monk Gamer, um, with their uh, the Mortal Realms podcast, they did a fantastic lore show on the Eden F Deep Ken, and I want to I want to promote it. It's awesome. If you guys want to know more about those Deep Ken, those uh, those fishy elves? Um, go check them out. It's yeah. Like- I mean, if you if you hate reading like I do. Uh, and rather would just listen to somebody explain all of the important stuff to you. It's really the way to go. Uh, really cuts out the middleman, I found. So, yes, absolutely. I'll link Stone Monk's video, the Mortal Realms video down below. So, it's pretty great. Uh, for myself, uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of it, so I'm going to mention it. You mentioned it offhand. Uh, but there may be some people who aren't aware of the Monday show who tuned in tonight and expected us to be talking about Deepkin. Mm. So my pick will simply be, we did a two and a half hour breakdown with Domus uh, on Monday on the Deepkin. Um, Domus is all in. He's, he's, he's Deepkin in. And, mm. uh, you know, he was a, a play tester obviously for it. So he's seen a lot of it for a while. He has a lot of experience. He went through it, gave us a lot of good insight. It was, um, it was a pretty fantastic show. So thank you again to Domus. Check that out. If you wanna if you wanna really see us go through all that, there you go. So. And by the way, Adam, he had the similar response because the actual like playtesters only see the rules. They don't mm-hmm. actually see the models. And so like he was familiar with it and they had playtested it and then he, they show up and he goes, Aw. <laughs> like he expected like the fish <laughs> Expected like all the fish stuff, yeah. And it's like, oh, these are these are just selves. Yeah, no, that was the that was the that was the reaction that I had at the press event at Adepticon too, because I was like really excited, and then I watched. It, I'm like, oh, it's just a bunch of wet elves. I was really hoping for, like, I'm thinking like murlocs and like you know that yeah. kind of stuff. You know, that's what I wanted to see: big bug eyed weirdos running around. But no, but yeah, that, honestly, the the press thing at Adepticon this year was. I don't want to say it was underwhelming. It's just that. They had such a, it was such a hard follow up to last year. Like, that's a really difficult, like, last year was crazy. And this year was like kind of normal. You know what I mean? And so that was like a difficult thing. I was, I was hoping they were going to drop some bomb at the end. And they were like, going to be like, oh, yeah, by the way, um, Mordheim, here you go, boom. And, you know, and like, you know, because last year they did that with Shadespire. They're all of a sudden like, oh, yeah, by the way, Shadespire. And then everybody got to play it. And it was awesome. So, um, yeah. We, well, we, had, we had some of that this conversation at Adepticon as well. We yeah, but, did, uh, and I will, I will like, humbly... This is a battle! <laughs> thank you. I will humbly disagree. This was the most, most important press event <laughs> in the history of Warhammer, now or for all times in the future, <laughs> as we got confirmed Plastic Sisters of Battle. Period. Thus saith the Lord. That's all I'm saying. So well, there is no bigger announcement. This is Emperor Willing 2019, which I think is a little bit of a cop out. Maybe I don't know. I'm I'm I've taken it now as dictum and have assumed that it will absolutely be the case. Yeah. Well, so I, I think my, it's going to be my unshakable faith is renewed. It's going to be very <laughs> interesting to see because they said also, and I, I talked a little bit about on one of my live shows recently. They they said that they were going to be working kind of with the community to some degree and that they were going to be showing like the design process as it goes and they were going to be looking for feedback and stuff like that which is relatively unprecedented for them certainly um and and i think it's a good thing so it'll be interesting to see how that works out and 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 you know if this is a grand experiment that they say okay well that was didn't work and then they don't do that anymore or if it becomes kind of the new the new normal um yeah it feels like they could go that direction certainly I mean, well, they've been doing it for fact, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep. They, they made it clear that this, like, the sisters are the product of the community feedback. Like, you know, that the, of the of that the survey that they did. And so it would make sense for them to lean into that. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what you want. So this is what you're going to get is mm-hmm. what, you know, this kind of interaction thing. Um, I don't know if they'll, they'll make a major turn towards that. But it's also a, a CYA type of thing as well. Like, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They can maintain a safe right. as they as so, they the project. 
Sure, sure, sure. It's it's yes, yes, Tom. The answer is yes, both. Right. Yeah. I mean, the answer is yes, both. Uh, okay. So uh, let's talk about some hobby time and what we've all been working on. So, Adam, what's on your table, buddy? What have you been working on? I, you, you've clearly got plenty of projects, that's for sure. So what do you actually been working on? Yeah, well, like I said, I've been working on um, the last couple sessions. I've been working on the Storm Fiends, and uh, I'm building – I mean, because the, the one you have to build basically close combat, mm-hmm. and you have two choices there, and the other two – you do have some range attack uh, choices, and I'm going range with both of those because I don't have a ton of range in my Nurgle Chaos Army, strangely enough. You know I mean? Like, I have... Literally all of my range is Skaven in my... in my Because I've got, like, Blight Kings, and, and my HQ unit is... Although I did just pick up the new... What is that new guy that throws the, that throws the, the heads? The which one? Uh, uh, Lord of Light. Lord. The Lord, yeah, of Light. Yeah, Lord of Light. I did just pick him up at the shop, and I'm going to build him because I was like, oh, he's kind of cool looking. I yeah, I didn't even really know much about him. And then I pull out the app, and I look it up, and I'm like, he can give the Blight Kings a range attack? Are you kidding me? So, yeah, I mean, he was an auto buy at that point. Um, so, yeah, he'll be going on probably right after the um, the Storm, the storm uh, Fiends. But otherwise, I've been doing a little bit of work on terrain and some of it has been on my 3d printer so i've been messing with that as well nice nice yeah. excellent i i know you i it's, i've watched a couple of your talks on that it seems like right now where we're at for terrain it's just it is a dream come true like i'm not i'm not sold on it for models right now but for terrain it's it is the answer oh yeah no definitely for models <clears throat> it's tough uh you need a really expensive like i just we're starting to play Dungeons and Dragons at work uh, during lunch on Tuesdays, so I used Hero Forge and I made myself my 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 dwarven cleric. Uh, and if you've ever used Hero Forge, it's pretty awesome. But you can kind of custom say, "Oh, I want this kind of thing and this and whatever." You pick all the little different parts and then you see it, and then you can get shapeways to print it. And um, I mean, it's not cheap. It's like you know, shipped to your house, it's about thirty five bucks. But then, let's be honest, so is many of the single figure dudes from, uh, yeah, from GW sure. these days. These these don't these models don't have as much detail, and they're not generally quite as dynamic. But they're also very very custom, and you can make them exactly the way you want. Um, those models are getting better and better. Like I printed one from them probably a year and a half ago, and then I just got this new one like last week, and I can already just in that time see a pretty surprising difference in the smoothness. You know, in the flat areas, you don't see that little ridgy stuff as much with them anymore. Um, but to get a machine that can do that well, um, that's that's a half a million dollar machine. So you're probably not going to have one of those in your house. Um, so yeah. But that being said, like the resin machines, um, the resin printers, which used to be also quite expensive for home use, but they were actually something you could get, they're now a good deal cheaper. Like there's one that I'm looking at and thinking just a little bit about that's like 500 bucks or 600 maybe. Um, right. But then you've got resin everywhere. You've probably got a UV cure it in some fashion, which a lot of people just go like to a company that sells beauty supplies. You can buy like these little UV oh, lights yeah. for, for nails, for I guess for fingernails. Yeah. And then you can use that to dump your model in there and then like UV cure it and all that kind of jazz. But I just don't, at this point, I don't plan on printing out models. I want to print out terrain. And at this point, filament machines are pretty pretty reasonable for that. So, yeah. Yeah, I picked up a bunch of like uh, 3D printed like mini terrain at Adepticon that I've been mm-hmm. using for basing. And it was like smooth. It's really nice. I've loved it. Like for that purpose, it's just, it's easy. And like, you know, I do, I have a bunch of the Her Starts molds, you yep. know, that I'll, I'll use for basing stuff too. Um, but I mean, the fact that I could just walk amongst this giant, like they had a big, big setup there. Um, shout out to like Shiny Dragon Combos, who was one of the people who was working there. I think it was miniature. I was getting it wrong. Miniature market? Yes. Miniature market. Yeah. yeah, miniature market. Market. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, they had just like all those boxes. Uh, hey, the, lo- the line is called Tiny Terrain, and it's a miniature mm-hmm. market. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, it was great. They had like a ton of boxes. It was all good quality stuff, and it was just like a dollar a piece for all these little pieces. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is true. It's like going along a buffet, right? I mean, just piled it in. Yeah, exactly. It was wonderful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all about that. I, I, for now, I'm happy to have somebody else do all the hard work for me on the models. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, 
like if again like i said if you want to even with a super crazy expensive machine that's still they don't generally look as good as the stuff that you can get from you know the big companies like games workshop or i mean you know like weird games has been doing amazing plastics and all that kind of stuff yeah but that being said like i said for for terrain i mean the fact that i can sit on my laptop you know on the couch and mess around with a bunch of shapes and do stuff and then eventually crank that thing out print it and then embellish it with other parts and this that and the other thing and, and create you know you could just you could do the same thing with like probably foam core and you know plastic card and stuff like that but sometimes it's just really especially for buildings if you're trying to make it look very building like and not weird and janky you know like when you're having to depend on your right. own hands to bend this piece perfectly that's a lot harder than it is to just use a computer tool and say make this a this radius curve please and then it just does it and then you print it and then you know it's yeah it's 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 not for everybody but if you like to you know dink around with gadgets and things like that um it, it, and then also use those gadgets to be able to create terrain. It's it's a kind of a fun amalgam of uh, interests. Right. I've been, I don't know. I've been flirting with it. I keep reading up on it and researching it. Like it's right in that wheelhouse of things that I like to do. Yeah. yeah. I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. So. He's been trying to trick me into going in with him, and I'm like, nah, man, this is you. This is you, dog. <laughs> this is all like, you. We could we could both go in on it, and he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> And I'm like, you want to sail that ship? You're alone. All the basing material you want, and he's like, nope, nope, not interested. No. I'm good, man. I got my Hearst Arts molds and some and some Magic Cast. I'm 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 good for now. Thanks. Uh, I'll buy the 3D printed terrain stuff I want. Okay. So uh, at any rate, uh, Tommy, what about you, man? What are you working on? Uh, I finally got my first batch of witches with pins on uh painting court so like my on my on my bottle or on my uh yeah so like they're ready they're table ready to be started and so um the long process of all of the witch elves being painted is starting um uh yeah i have a lot of bodies to paint uh if i carry this out for holy wars next year i'm gonna have like 150 some bodies to paint so, um, yeah, this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> like, and so I'm just, um, so no, it's, Hey, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you're painting all the witch elves. Cause you know, you and I were talking and it was funny because, you know, we're going to partner up and run both right. run daughters at Holy Havoc. Yep. And I realized that I'm going to get to the end of my daughters of Cain, like to what I consider a finished army. Yep. Okay. Like I'll have, I don't know, 3000 ish points, something like that, 3,500, somewhere in that range. And uh, I'm not going to have any witch elves. I feel like I was just like, no, I'm good. Just don't need them. I've got the sisters. They got little whips. That's fine. It's close enough. Uh, I'm, I'm going snakes. And then you were like, yeah, I'm doing all these witches. And I was like, great. That is called the free rider dilemma. Because when we team up, I'll get all the benefit of having a ton of witches without having to put in the effort of painting a bunch of witches. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, my, like, I'm only doing six of the 120, like, witch-ish models. Only 60 of them are actual witches. The other 60 are sisters. But still, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, they're all the same model, just with different weapons. Um, they're all going to sure. have, like, the full hair head of witches because that's the right way to go. Um, that is the right way to go. Yeah, so I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm looking forward to it, kind of. I'm looking forward to it so much that I've decided that I'm clipping sprues, and and working on my backlog of sprues right now, rather than in prepping those model. I mean, they're ready for priming, so I guess I can blame it on that. But I'm working on I'm working on cleaning out my sprue backlog and clipping it for bits. So nice. That's called, uh, that's called that deflection, is what yeah. that is. That's exactly right. Yes. Like Sorry. If you see me out working in the yard, that's me not wanting to do the next thing that's on my hobby uh, table. It's yeah. funny you say that. I spent all last weekend out on the yard, and I cleaned out all the stuff and prepared it for the spring and getting ready to prepare the deck to restain. And yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. You, switch, you should switch to an army that has fewer units in it. That's what you should do. That's, that's what I generally do. I know. He can't help himself. That's yeah. the problem. See, yeah. he's got a he has a he has a problem. Well, that, I mean, that look is, at Grotz. Something that requires bodies. Yes, exactly. 
This is his thing every time. He just he likes bodies, and then he's like, "But it's so much to paint." And I'm like, "Well, you did this to yourself. There were elite <laughs> options, and you didn't choose them." I like I don't know to, what to tell you, man. I'm playing armies. Um. <laughs> I like to hey, twenty three figs feels like an army to me, brother. I feel like I got. I'm piloting an army. It's two thousand points. I'm good. That is that is a working number for me. That's all I'm saying. Uh, all right. Uh, for myself, I'm working on my second unit of uh, Blood Sisters. Speaking of snakes, they're back on my desk at home. They're not here with me in this random hotel I'm at. Uh, but yeah, moving them along. So uh, two down, and that'll be that'll be two down and two to go. So there you go. Uh, those models ever, are really good. Do you ever take uh, hobby projects with you on the road? I don't. I really don't. I do not. I'm. I am an absolute like. I'm very picky. Mm -hmm. about painting like i my setup is very particular everything is exactly how i want it yeah i don't know that so i would like, paint on the road but i could see myself building you know yeah i mean part of the problem is i'm flying and i don't want to bring like like what am i going to put clippers and an exacto knife in i don't check baggage mm -hmm. ever. No, that's true that's so true. like and there that's not going to fly they're going to catch that one no <laughs> so i mean you know sometimes when i'm traveling just for like a marathon or something uh, to like if I'm going to get together and play D and D for a weekend at a friend's house, so for you know a personal thing, sure. I'll bring a a unit or something to paint, and I'll that's okay. Like I'll put up with it if it's especially if it's something that I that isn't. I'll try to bring like side projects, you know. What I mean like one off stuff that isn't really for an army that I can just play around with. So, and that that way I don't mind that my setup is different because when I'm in you know like with my army I have like my exact set of paints and they're arrayed in a specific way in front of me and my wet palette is all prepared and. You know, like da -da 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 -da. so, you know, it's hard to bring that to pack all that up. Yeah, I can't really paint any place else other than home, but I, I do sometimes like go down to the shop to to like clip, you know, and build and glue and stuff like that, like while talking to people or whatever. But uh, yeah, I I can't if I'm in paint mode, I'm I'm at home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's there's just something comfortable about it, right? Like that's the that is the spot. You you get your hobby debt once you. Once you have your actual hobby desk set up, it's hard to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Right. So there you go. All right. Well, let's uh, let's turn to some feature segment this week because we have Uncle Adam here. And the, uh, we're always happy to have Uncle Adam on the show, of course. But this time, I'm particularly excited about what we're talking about. Um, I have a strong belief that one of the biggest challenges in this hobby right now is simply connecting people, right? Like how often do you see on Facebook and on Twitter and on anywhere of like, hey, we're looking for people to play in this area or we've got an event this weekend. You pass the word along if you can, right? Like it is one of the most common things I see. And the communication challenge of getting people together, you know, we, we kind of talked about this for just a minute or two before the show. I think it is the unspoken barrier of entry, and it's the thing that can get people out of the hobby, right? Like, yes, we know there's a cost to barrier of entry, and yes, we know there's a uh, sort of the time commitment and stuff like that, the skill of maybe people want to paint, don't feel like they can. I agree all that's a barrier of entry, but not nothing gets you out quicker than having no one to play with, mm -hmm. right? If there's nobody to sit across the table from you, and by the way, you need more than one person generally. Right, because the how long are the two of you going to keep rolling dice against each other? One of the problems with this is you kind of need a big group, right? You and meta. there needs to be a group to be interact with. Yeah, and like, how do you? There could be tournaments going on around you, and unless you're like well connected, you happen to be in the right Facebook group for your area, you happen to clue in that it exists, you might not even know there's a tournament going on that weekend, right? That kind of thing. This is, to me, the great challenge. There's been lots of little bites at the apple uh, to try to solve this. But I know that you, as part of a, as like an adjacent passion project to your normal job, had the, the good nature or good fortune to be able to, to sort of partially solve this problem. So, uh, and that's obviously through Game 4. So it's an app. And I'll, I'll let you dig into all that. I'm not going to talk that part for you, but uh, because I don't want to screw it up. But uh, but that was the main thing I wanted to 
to sort of talk about intro. So, yeah, I mean, how do you think about this challenge and how did it lead you to the app, that kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's really a big portion of what made us kind of really believe that this was something that was necessary. Um, long story short was uh, the two of the partners, two of the, 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 the owners of the company um, were just – basically commiserating about how they wanted to play more Star Wars X-Wing. Um, and they were just having a hard time, you know, hooking up with the right group or the right people and finding events and things like that. And they said, you know, we make apps for a living. We should, we should, there should be an app. And then they looked around a little bit and there, there had been some attempts, but nothing was working particularly. And so then that was kind of when the idea was born. Um, and that was in late 2015, actually. Um, so it was a, an idea they kicked around and did a little bit of research and thought about and everything in between regular paying gigs and things like that. And then I started working for the company uh, in 2016, mid-2016. Uh, I came in as a designer and, and kind of marketing and whatnot uh, guy. And, um, and I was also partially hired because of my background in gaming and because of my background in YouTube and my background and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we started working on the, 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 the overall design for the game uh, in, like I said, really started in, in earnest in, in probably September-ish of 2016 and uh, came up with a name and what we were going to be doing and, and the, the kind of the angle we were going to attack from and, and how it was different from the other apps out there. And then um, programming actually started just before Christmas of 2016 and then ran through pretty much all of 2017, and we launched uh, we launched the app just before Christmas of 2017. So it's just barely four months since we launched the app. Um, so long and the short of it is is that in video games, if you want to play a multiplayer game, you just go to the little menu thing that says multiplayer. You click it, they hook you up with a bunch of people, who knows where, and you play that game, and then you're done, and that's easy for the tabletop games, the stuff that we do. And it's not just for war gamers. It's also for board gamers. It's also for role-playing gamers. It's also for collectible card gamers. Um, we're, we're very neutral on that, and we want to go for all tabletop gaming. Um, but the hardest part is trying to find people to play with. Uh, and because you're right. You could be completely just ships passing in the night. There's, there, there's so many stories I hear from people who are like, I did not know I lived around, the, literally around the corner from another 40K player. And we've right. never met you know, at the local shop. We've never come across pads or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. yep. So, so we wanted to be able to use um, an app to be able to, to try to f help fix that, tr that problem because you, you sort of touched on it as well. Facebook is not generally the answer um, to, frankly, in my opinion, most questions that, that, that could be asked, it's not the answer, but um Lately, especially like every last little thing that's been showing up in the news about Facebook, uh, we all kind of look at it at work and we all say, thank you, uh, Uncle Mark, that I appreciate that you're, you know, <laughs> having to go in front of the Senate and, 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 and look like an alien and go through all that stuff and everything. And I have, you know, like they sent out this thing probably about a month ago or so where this, it was in everybody's feed and it said, Hey, good news. We're going to stop showing you so much stuff from businesses and groups and start showing you more friends and family, which is great for a lot of people, but for stores and for gaming groups, yeah. they're like, wait, so even fewer people are going to see the stuff that we post. I mean, right now, when we were at the Gamma trade show in Reno back in whenever the heck that was, beginning of, beginning of March, I think, or mid-March, um, we were at the Gamma trade show and we were talking to store owners and, and we would ask them, like, do you have a Facebook page? And they would say, well, of course. Well, how, many, how many likes do you have on your Facebook? How many follows? Oh, like a thousand. And I'm like, okay, cool. When you post an event, how many people actually see it? And then they're like, right. well, according to, according to Facebook, about 100. But then it's immediately followed up with an email saying, hey, for $30, we'll show it to 200 more people. And then your, your, your thought process is like, but 1,000 people said they like my stuff. So why don't I see, like, why doesn't everybody see my stuff? So we don't have an algorithm. We don't work in that area. What we do is we completely base everything. We base everything off of events because there have been other apps out there that have tried to do the same sort of thing that we're doing now, but they based it off of people. So 
it was more of a you use the app, you punched in like a profile, and then you and then it was like, okay, cool. There's 12 people who live near you who are also in the app. Why don't you make some friends? And that's not the way that gamers kind of work. You know what I mean? A lot of us right, have a tendency right. to be introverted, and we need some direction. We need some some help with that. So if it's more about going to to an event. And then you meet people at that event that is easier and an easier sell to a person than it is to just, well, why don't you make some friends? And here's, here's some friends. Why don't you send them a message out of the blue? You know what I mean? And so when people sometimes refer to the app as Tinder for gamers, I always like to say, well, no, because it's not, it's not so much person to person. It's more about here's the events that are happening near you. And you can put in a looking for players thing, which is kind of like that three by five card on the cork board at the back of the, the, the game store, you know, right. that says, hey, we're looking for Age of Sigmar players, you know, ch send a text to Chuck and uh, and we'll, you know, try to go from there where we've got that functionality as well in the app. And then we've also got we've just recently added about a month ago store uh, groups and clubs uh, support. So now you can start a group, start a club. And we just passed. Oh, I think we we were just checking numbers earlier today. I think we just passed like 500 different groups and clubs that have cropped up uh, since we launched it. And um, and then we've also got the big store finder, which is like the big fourth kind of pillar of the app. Uh, we've got 6,000 stores worldwide uh, in the app and about 2,800 of them roughly are in the United States. So, you know, uh, that, that's it's kind of just interesting to see that information and to be able to just very quickly, like when we were looking for that information, you know, it was so many different places we had to go to kind of call this information from. And the fact that now you can just pick up your phone and check what's local and then be like, oh, cool, there's, an, there's a you know, game store I've never heard of a couple cities over as I'm traveling through this area. I mean, for you, for traveling for work, this yep. could be super useful to just find, you know, small game stores and maybe find some out of stock or out of print, you know, something or other that you've been wanting to pick up or whatever. I mean, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. can I tell you, can I tell you a quick funny story about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So <laughs> it's exactly what you're talking about. First of all, the, just to, to really pin on something that was being talked about in the comments and that I think you, you answer really well, the fact that it is event and store focused and mm -hmm. that it's about, drawing people to those locations one it means that the store owners are really incentivized to be on here yep. you've probably got the biggest store listing in the world of, yeah. of game stores anybody probably. who's tried to find game stores in an area knows that basically like go into google and type in like game stores i mean you get just like this weird mix of like game stops and crap like that you've got to sort and filter through it's just mm -hmm. a pain it's a super pain um yeah. But and also because you know you're at like this neutral place, it's a store, it's a thing. You're not just it's it's not that Tinder experience where you just got to go meet a random person in some <laughs> random place, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's you're going to this, you know, you're yeah. going to like an actual game store where there's an established community and stuff like that. You have a lot of experience meeting random people through uh, Tinder in random places. Absolutely. So uh, yes, <laughs> that's how I met my wife and my second and third and fifth wife. Yeah, not the fourth one though. Um, so. The uh, but here's the funny story. So uh, there's a particular I do travel a lot for work and there's a particular client that I go to that where I'm at their office. I don't know, probably six times a year at least. OK, uh, in a relatively big city. And so two days ago, I got a delivery of a commission piece I agreed to do for someone as a reward for a tournament. And the person had ordered it, like the TO had ordered it from a store. And so when it showed up in the box, it had a, the business card of the store he had ordered from in the box. And I looked at the card and I was like, huh. And I looked at the address and it was literally a block and a half, like around the corner and a block and a half away from like this big client that I go to all the time and spend multiple days at and had no idea that this store existed. I've been doing it for, I've been traveling to this place for two years, right? And had no clue that this store existed a block and a half away. Mm -hmm. I, randomly, the business card was there. I would have never known. I would have gone another two years. Can I raise you another right. uh, story, Vince? Sure, you can one-up me all you want, Tom. Awesome. So a couple weeks ago, I found myself in Maine, in the Portland area, <laughs> and I was like, huh. Well, I have a couple hours to burn before I need to, you know, pick up some other folks from the airport. And so I'm like, well, I have this Game 4 app. So I popped it open. And I was like, oh, there's six stores in the area. I wonder if there's any out-of-print stuff. 
And so like, it's funny, like, Adam, that, like, that's exactly where my head went. And I was like, people keep out of print stuff all the time on shelves. And so I just went hunting in the Portland area, Portland area for their, at their six stores to see what was there. Found a really nice, cute, like game room place. Great play space. Unfortunately, they like kept all the shelves curated with all the newest stuff. So I'm like, yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> there's, no, there's no gold in 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 them, them their shelves. Um, but uh, no, it was it was a uh, it was a wonderful experience. You know, like we had talked at at Adepticon, and so I downloaded it and mm-hmm. and went through, and it ended up being this wonderful like opportunity to like explore the area. Yeah, it's it, it it it's we've been getting getting feedback from people. Um, we I had someone set, reach out to me recently who said that they were driving from Eastern Tennessee mm. to Missouri, and said that along that what that route it was for something for work. He he stopped at three or four different game stores along the way that he would have just driven by, like you know, because they would have been off the highway and whatnot and everything. Would have had no idea, and so that kind of thing is something that helped him to 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 be able to find more places to kind of stop and check out. And and I know what you mean about like when you have those stores, you have those game stores that are very proactively run. Let's just say, for lack of a better term, you're rarely going to find those weird out of print you know things. But when you find those game stores that we're kind of generally used to you know where it's got a bit of an odor to it and it's uh it's sort of dark and weird that's sometimes where you can find some some definite gems uh when i we- picked i picked up a copy of um oh what the heck was it it was a space uh skirmish game made by osprey uh that was done by the guy who did um or, well i think it was done by the guy who do- who does um uh, andreas figoli who does uh uh, Song of Blades and Heroes, and I can't think of what it's called now, uh, but it like sold out instantly. It was one of those blue covered books, you know, and it sold out almost instantly. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. I'm going to have to wait like three or four months for it to be reprinted. And I just happened to go into this this shop uh, when I was down in Madison, and I was like, oh, hey, there's one right here on the shelf. You know, okay, cool. So that's kind of helpful too, yeah. But uh, is it no, Rogue? Is it Rogue Stars? Is yes, that the that's the one. It? Rogue Stars. I couldn't think of the name. There you yeah. go. Shout out to Tiny Member who uh, who called it out in the comments. So thanks, nice. buddy. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to pick up Rogue Stars when it was out of print everywhere, but um, uh, Pegasus Games in Madison, Wisconsin, had been sitting on the shelf because it's just it's one of those places that's like that we grew up with. You know what I mean? But um, uh, yeah. So you you find all kinds of weird stuff there, and and that's really kind of the point. Part of the point of the app is to be able to, and you touched on it a bit as well. I think uh, Vince about how it's a it's a public space. Like right now, all the events that are in the app have to be at the game stores that are in our admittedly quite large uh, database. Um, so it's one of those situations where we're doing that because of privacy and safety concerns. And, uh, right. but that being said, very soon there will be um, the ability for group, groups and clubs to be able to start to, to put into their, uh, you know, they're they're listing on the on the on the on the, the app the ability because there's a lot of groups and clubs that are reaching out to us to us saying we don't have our meetings at a, at a game store we have our meeting in a church basement or a community center or a cafe or whatever or a bar and so um, we're going to be launching this coming up soon where they will be able to s- submit an, an, a, a place and be like okay well this is the, the restaurant that we have our thing at and then we'll go online real quick to make sure that it's real and it's a real place and the whole deal and then that will be saved in their group account so that when they say we're having an event and it's at this place they'll be able to do that but they won't be able to be like we're having the event at bob's house we don't we still don't want that at this point if it's a private uh, group event that only group members you know, can go to, then they can make it whatever address they want, because then that's a whole different story, but it can't draw sure, in sure. people outside the group and potentially into who knows what's going to occur. So okay. we're very, we're very um, cognizant of the safety concerns, privacy concerns, all that kind of stuff, because this is all, st- I mean, I don't have any kids, but you know, the, the, the two owners, the two, the two main partners, they both have, you know, multiple kids. So, these are things that they're thinking of, um, uh, you know, definitely. And it's something that obviously we've also heard feedback as well. Um, so we're, we're, we, you know, we're trying to make sure that we can kind of make both sides happy because there are people who are like, I want to have strange people over to my house randomly. And we're like, well, you know, that's your own thing. Uh, but we're going to try to like 
you know, dial that back a little bit here. Um, they but, you know, make tenure for that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, no, that's, that's really kind of what's going on. We launched it, like I said, just before Christmas. Um, it's been growing really nicely. Uh, I did a video about it again in like mid March, just before we went to, uh, Gamma. And then while we were at the Gamma trade show, which is all just the people walking up and down the aisles of that trade show are all store owners. Um, we got lots of tons of great feedback, very positive feedback as well from store owners and signed up a lot of stores. Uh, sign up for a store. If your local store is not in the store finder, um, they can contact us very easily and just say, hey, and then we'll put them in there. And if they would like to be verified, um, that's also free. And then that, if a store becomes verified, then the stores can post their own events in the app. And when you're looking through the list of events, you'll see of certain events that will say event hosted by and the name of a store. So that's kind of like a special call out that, uh, you know, like if you or I just posted an event, you wouldn't see that extra line at the bottom of the card. You know, it would say when you go into the detail view, it'll say this event is, you know, was posted by Adam, but it won't. You know, it doesn't have that extra call out to let you know that, hey, this is at a store and it's run by the store. And that's a kind of a thing. Um, we also just did a deal with um, International Tabletop Day, which is this coming up this Saturday. Uh, and so if you're running an event on the 28th, when you put it into the thing, it will say, hey, is this a International Tabletop Day event? Because it's on the 28th. And if you click oh, nice. it says yes, then it kind of puts like a special kind of logo in there to let you know that this is International Tabletop Day. It causes it in the card view to, to stand out a little bit nicer. Um, Actually, Geek and Sundry did an article about us yesterday, which has also brought a lot of new traffic and a lot of new signups. We've signed up an extra, oh gosh, nearly 2,000 people. We were like at, we were at just shy of 10,000 when the article went live, and now we're just shy of 12,000, like about a little over 24 hours later. So um, yeah, that was a nice, a real nice uh, jump. Um, but yeah, we've been getting more press. You know, obviously, I've been doing a lot of uh, different you know podcasts and YouTube channels and blogs and this and that and the other thing and it's been helping but we do also really want to start spreading it out more into because it's been pretty war game heavy because that's kind of my area but we also want it to get more into you know role playing games and, and board games and all that kind of stuff too so um, yeah that's kind of where it's at and we've got new features coming out soon and I know one I think that Vince you want to talk about is probably like tournaments and those types of events as well Yep, absolutely. I want to talk about that a lot because here's ultimately my thing. And I think this is really like, this is something I really realized unless you're really like dialed in to sort of the, the scene, you know, a lot of the TOs and stuff like that, it can be really hard to know what events are going on in your area. It would mm -hmm. not be unusual to, to have like, there's probably a tournament going on. If you live in a major city, there's probably a tournament going on for a war game you're playing within, you know, a, this weekend or the previous weekend or the weekend after some kind of event going on. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're in somewhere like the Northeast or somewhere that's really hopping. Right. Yeah. But how do you even know where it's at? Do you know that it's coming? Right. This is the sort of thing. So I think like what I really, really want to encourage is I know there's a lot of TOs that are around the U S and it's something I've pushed with because I'm connected enough with a lot of them. I think that I would love to see the big push for TOs to get on here, start using this and that kind of thing, because this is, I think, the way where we can all actually see all those events that are happening in a way that's so much smoother than just like, as you said, throwing up a random Facebook post that maybe people see, maybe they don't. Right. Right. And, and Facebook is also so siloed. Like if you don't go to the right group and get into it, you're right. going to have a very hard time finding events that are like just, you know, you can just do a, an open graph search up at the top and search for Age of Sigmar to try to find events, but you're going to find probably damn near everything but, you know what I mean? Yeah. So in that situation, um, it's very difficult. Once you know a certain group of people or a certain group who run certain events and you become a person who likes their page, perhaps, then you'll hopefully get more of their information, but you still aren't guaranteed to get all of it. The idea of that behind Game 4 is that you don't even have to know about the silo to be able to get information out of it. You know what I mean? Yep. If Basically, if you just go and look and it's a local thing, you can change the um, the radius for events, like where you want to search your your, radio, your events. You can change that radius up to a 1,000 miles. Uh, and we also, for people overseas, there's a thing where you can switch over to kilometers. It's in the settings and preferences. But... Um, 
that that whole thing, like if you want to travel, well, knock yourself out. Now, if you want to do that, where it's, you know, you're going to set it for a thousand miles and then in the filters, you can turn on and turn off any of the four main genres. So let's say if you were just looking for wargaming events, you could turn off board games, RPGs, and CCGs, raise it up to a thousand and then see uh, an amazing, especially as we get more and more people in the app, you're going to see very easily and quickly all the different possible places you could end up going to play or or anything along those lines really quickly. Are you going to, so as events kind of take off, and as mm -hmm. you move into the new feature, is one is one aspect of, will we be able to search specific games or only genre? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And will we, like, so if I want to look for only AOS events, can I do that in a regimented way? That I don't, it's not dependent upon keywords. Like, that need me, like, some might list it as AOS, some might list it as Age of Sigmar, or some might list it as Warhammer, who knows. Sure. Um, so the one is, are we able to search specific games? And likewise, are we able to search specific size events? And what I mean by that is, is this a local club event? Or is this a 30-person mm -hmm. GT? Like, is there any sense of in the searching, being able to filter out those things. I think that there's probably not for that type of event, not the size okay. thing. Um, we would hope that a person would, um, in the description of the event, try to say like how many people they plan on having, or if this is okay. a this is a 128 seat event. I mean, because you're going to know that up front by based off of just how many tables you have, you know. So you would, I would think you would put that kind of information into the the profile information or the, the description for the profile, uh, or for that events profile. Uh, and that's a real, just real quick, that's a thing we should hone in on, because with these events, it's not just like you see Age of Sigmar two-day event, or two-day tournament, or something like that, right? Or right, whatever. yeah, you see that there's in a, the card. There's a whole extra detail. Yeah, you see that card, yeah. and then you click, and then you go in, and then you see uh, information and you know where it's going to be, what the time is going to be, what the address, all that kind of stuff. And we also generally assume that, that the person who's, if they want to get the information out there, they're also going to say, well, I want, you know, it's this much to enter and it's the 2000 points and this and that and the other thing. And I don't off the top of my head remember right now if HTML links are working within the within the profile information, the description or not. I know that was on the roadmap and I don't know if it's in the current version or if it's coming up in one of the next couple of versions. But that way then you could also say, you know, click here to go and see the rules and or to just go to the website. I mean, we're not trying to keep people particularly like in our app. We want, you know, we want people to come back and check it out obviously very frequently, but we're not saying, oh, this is a walled garden, and if you want to run your stuff through our system, you have to keep it in our system. If, if, if people find your event and you have a link that clicks and goes to the, your website, so that's where they can buy the tickets or register or whatever, that we're absolutely interested in being able to help facilitate that. Um, as far as the game titles that you asked, Tom, right now we're not we don't have, and we've we've come across this issue, and we knew we were going to have it off the off the bat. Was that people can put in the game title, uh, but yeah, you're right. Some people will say, you know, AOS. Some people will say Age of Sigmar. Some people will say Warhammer. Some, you know, so we don't, and we currently don't have a search function for say titles or text or keywords or things like that. That is coming. It's on the roadmap. And when we do that, then our plan is to also. Um, much like we did with the store listing, we are looking at building a, uh, and this is this is daunting uh, because as we as I've been saying this sentence, five more board games have come out. But we want to we want to have basically a database. Um, we're we're hoping to work. There's a uh, board game geek has an API, so mm -hmm. that um, you can kind of access that. And then we would make a deal where a person would start typing like age of, and then it would like auto complete. And then that way, when you right. search on it, hopefully it's matching up the date. It's just basically data binding issues and things like that. Um, but the that's, have, that's a plan it, down the road. We did the gamer profile show last mm -hmm. week about like personality, you know, personality profiles for gamers and stuff like that. And in there, you they asked you to enter your games, and they clearly had a very robust database sure. where they were talking about board games. I started to type. Like, I didn't even think that Warhammer would have qualified. And I was like, oh, maybe Warhammer. I typed it out. And obviously, like, all the Warhammer Quest expansions. And, and so, it, like, clearly, like, they had a robust database. And so I it got me thinking about databases. It's most games. likely from – most likely they're actually also using the the, the Board Game Geek API. Right. Which and, is and, and, and that's what, like, that's what it, it was. It was really clear 
because uh, there's a link to Board Game Geek at the end of it because you can tie your profile to it. So I'm sure, sure that they're using it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's that's also uh, part of the roadmap as well is to be able to put that kind of information. Because right now, if you're, let's say you're doing a looking for players listing, you in the description can say, oh, you know, I like to play a bunch of different stuff, yada, 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 yada. And I work second shift. So, but I all, I'm always off on weekends. And so send me a message, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can put that, and the more information you put in that, the better you're like, if you're, you know, and, and to, to a degree, like if you think about a dating app, if you were to do some sort of thing like that and you weren't to really to put in much in the way of information, you're right. not going to get a lot of responses, but the more information hopefully that you can put in, hopefully it'll help. So it's the same type of deal in this situation that looking for players, if you're just like, I want to play games, you're not going to get a lot of response. But if you kind of explain it a little bit better, you're a little bit more likely to get that response. Uh, but in that, there's also a little section for titles I would like to play, and then you can type in a bunch of stuff, but it's totally free form. You can misspell or screw up or whatever you want to do, but at least it's an area to kind of get people thinking because it's when they're writing the description, people hate to write. You know, most people, writers like to write, but most everybody else kind of hates it. So when you're saying, hey, put in a description of yourself, they're like, oh, come on, man. I just want to play some games. So when we say, well, type in the games you like, they're like, oh, that I can do, you know, and that's so that helps to just get more information out of the person. It's more of a user experience thing that we kind of worked on. Yeah, right on. I mean, <clears throat> for me, I think it's the like, this is sort of the map of how we get to getting more people involved in events. And the reason I think it's good, I think there's a lot of people who are generally scared of tournaments because the only tournaments that they might readily hear about are like the big tournaments. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. Like they, everybody hears about like Adepticon or LVO right. or something like that. Yeah. Right. And they're like, well, geez, I don't want my first tournament experience to be walking into this giant convention hall right? And there's 200 people playing and I don't really know anybody. Now, there's some people who will do that and cool, like more power to them. By the way, yeah. um, you're never going to find friendlier people in my experience in general. Like I've had nothing positive experiences at those events. So I would encourage mm -hmm. people to not be scared about that. Yeah, exactly. But, I understand but it is why daunting. You... Absolutely. Yes. But every, at well, almost every local shop at some point has some sort of tournament for almost any game generally. I mean, like I know of in the relatively, you know, small city that I live in, the 70,000, there's two game shops. And on any given weekend, absolutely, well, on every given weekend, at least one of those shops is running an X-Wing tournament, you know, all right. the time. And then uh, 40K is also a big one for both of those stores. And Age of Sigmar is for those two stores for one it's you're seeing players but you're not seeing enough necessarily for events but one of the stores is all in and is starting to run shadespire and they bought the whatever the the prize the, the organized play kit and all that kind of stuff so yeah you, you you definitely and the thing is is that you know within 50 miles of where i'm sitting there's nearly a hundred stores so um it's kind of weird uh it like as we did a bunch of research well no i take that back it's the other way around within 100 miles there's 50 stores which sounds you know worse but it's still that's a lot of stores yeah exactly but um but when we were originally trying to first start figuring out how we were going to build the store listing i just did this search of trying to figure it out and going that way and i got all these stores and i missed a store that was literally less than a mile from my desk at work. I mean, it was it, right. it was like there was a board game store in this little mall that if there was a couple buildings that weren't in the way, I probably could have hit it with an arrow. I mean, it was like that close. <laughs> um, it would have been a heck of a shot, but I could have done it. And uh, it, it, but it just, I just didn't come across it when I went through all the different places I went through. So um, we've had some of the stores, uh, that store in particular, actually, the, the one I was just talking about that we missed the original time, they were looking at the looking for players listings in the region. And they were seeing a lot of people who were posting saying that they wanted to play fifth edition D and D and they were looking for people to play with. So this store just made a fifth edition D and D night and then reached out to those players and was like, look, Hey, we're this store. If you want, we're running a night that night. If it's, you know, just come and check it out. And you know, that's, that's the store being proactive and looking for the region and saying what's going on in the region and what kind of people are, what are people looking for? And maybe that's a need that I should try to serve. And then that just is that another thing that you can't get right now with any other system. Yeah, that's super awesome. Uh, like that's, 
That's fantastic. Because again, it's one of those things where like, if TOs are using it, if game stores are using it, if those people who can host the events, who are running the events, who are the like tastemakers, the wrong word, but like, yeah, the reality is we need the game store, right? Like that, that is the center point. It's the fulcrum, right? It is the star around which these things are orbiting. So mm-hmm. when they're there, it's, there's a complete, it's, it's the, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Because the game stores can benefit because certainly more, I mean, I'm sure they're, they would love to have more players come in and visit their store. And if we, as a community constantly talk about, well, support your local game store, right? Support your mm-hmm. FLGS. Well, great. This makes it a lot easier way to do it to even know what your FLGS options are. And it makes it easier for your FLGS to actually serve you, which is going to make you happier to support them. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and that's the big thing, too. Like we've been pushing both uh, reaching out, obviously, to, to, to users and, and that. But we're also pushing out heavily to stores as well, because we understand that. The store, if they can see the benefit, which many of them, I mean, we've been, it's been pretty much nonstop verifying stores. Uh, we've been, we've been in a situation where we understand that when they look at it and we can kind of, especially at Gamma, I was like, look, you know, this is what's going on with Facebook right now. How well do you feel served in that situation? If you were to use this app and you were to tell the people who come into your store, look, I'm not really going to, I mean, we've had stores that have posted on Facebook saying, we're not really going to post on Facebook anymore. We're using this app now. Um, So uh, because, you know, and those of you who aren't seeing this, it's because of Facebook that you're not seeing it. You know what I mean? Um, it's the exact same thing. We're not using an algorithm. We're not hiding the stuff. We're not saying, oh, hey, you know, we're if, if you've got the, the radius set and the game filter set, we're going to show you all the events in that in those parameters. So um, the people who want to run events will know that the people who are looking at the app and, and, and looking at that that stuff will find it. And if they're interested, then they're going to make the next move and attend or at least maybe drop by, you know, because it, you know, Obviously, you guys are very focused on on um, on tournaments and everything like that because that's kind of the that's that's the big part of the hobby for you guys. Obviously, besides the painting as well, but there are plenty of people out there too that are just like I'm interested, but I don't know anybody, and I haven't even bought any models right. yet. But I would love to come down and look at like even just people playing or a small tournament or something like that and kind of get the feel for it and then decide if I want to pull the trigger. So we're looking, and, and again, we're all talking right now, obviously mostly about wargaming, but there's also people who are, you know, board gamers, magic players, role players, and people who are like on the cusp and they need to have some sort of reinforcement by finding other humans who are also cool with it and are looking to play. And then that will help hopefully to push more people into the hobby, into the hobbies really. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, we're we're obviously this is Warhammer Weekly, so we're talking about that as as sure. the element. But you're 100 percent right. I mean, I'm the luck. I am lucky as all get out that I've had a stable D and D group to play once a week with for 17 years. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, but that is not most people's experience, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And and that's exactly the same thing. Where like, if you don't have the people, and if you can't easily organize. And if you can't find the space to play, your game falls apart instantly. Yeah, right? at like that point, you just, just become a hobby painter, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. For stuff to set on your shelf. Yeah, exactly. And so the, it, it overcomes every element of this to me because in all aspects of what you're talking about, right? Like, no matter whether you're attacking this from a war game perspective, CCGs, RPGs, whatever, mm-hmm. um, this is a social hobby that the more or less the more people you have as options to roll with the more events you have the option of participating in and joining in with it's not like you're suddenly compelled to do all this stuff you know like tom and i are going to nashcon in a little over a month right down in nashville i'm not going well, to tom's not you're not because you're a loser i'm going down to nashcon in a little over a month mm-hmm. tom's a loser um and my my big fear is like you know we talk about it on the show often enough it's a great tournament it's run by a great dude who's doing a lot to promote it but how many people who probably are within an hour of that area and might be interested in coming just don't even know, okay. haven't even heard of it. Right? I, I ran a I ran a small convention here, it, uh, just a general tabletop uh, gaming convention. So it, it, there was some miniature stuff in it, but it also had a lot of people. It was it was very dependent upon what the local people wanted to run. You know, the the, the GMs would come and run, and they would mostly run a lot of board games. But there was other stuff going on as well. Anyway, I ran that for about a, a little over a decade, 
uh, here in town. And I would run, you know, I was five years into it and I would run into gamers who lived here in town as well, who had never heard of it. And we're talking about, a, you know, right. 70,000 people. I told that story to uh, Hank, uh, Hank Edley, who is part of the, the, the magical duo that basically controls and runs uh, Adepticon. Okay. So Hank and I were having a conversation on the phone and, and, uh, and I, I told him that thing and he said, he has run into Warhammer 40 play Warhammer 40k players in Chicago who have never heard of Adepticon. Ah, I yeah, mean, like absolutely, it's the, it's the biggest convention for wargaming in the entire country, and you live in the city it's in, and you've never heard of it. And it's not because you're you're dumb or anything like that. It's just that ships passing in the night. Like, not all marketing reaches all people. That's the way it works. So if we can yeah. help to maybe push those things a little bit more over the edge, so that it becomes even easier for you just to go, oh yeah, oh Adepticon, I've never heard of that. You know, just look on your phone and find, or whether it's just you know. We're running uh, demos at uh, the local shop, or we're running a tournament at the local shop, or or a group is running something at the community center that they use every other month, or whatever the deal is. Those things are what things we want people to be able to really start picking up on, so that we can get more people into t tabletop gaming, and the ones that are already into it can find the other ones who are already into it. That's really the big point. Yeah, I mean, it's just a question of like the focus of the tool that's being used to share that information, right? None of these other tools are really like, you know, we mentioned Facebook or whatever, but there's mm -hmm. certainly plenty others. These aren't tools focused on this information right, or exactly. sharing information. They're not bespoke to that thing, right? Yeah. And as somebody who like in my day job focuses on building software with a bespoke purpose, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not like you couldn't use other incredibly generic tools to, to do some of what, you know, what, what we're doing. The problem is it's not going to be near as efficient. It's not going to be near as effective and you're not going to capture everything you want and you're not going to, and you're going to miss things. Right. It's the same exact challenge here. I right. mean, we've, you know, with our groups and clubs, we're basically going head to head with meetup, which is a humongous app and it's got, you know, millions of dollars, I'm sure. But, uh, we've, uh, we, you know, we talked to gaming clubs in our area, uh, and they're like, yeah, we use meetup, but, it's got these problems and these problems and these problems that that that, are, that don't, and they're they're problems not because like the app is poorly done or anything like that. It's just because you're trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. You're trying to fit a gaming club into this sort of general clubbish app, which is frankly more often than not aimed a little bit more towards people who are outdoorsy and things like that. And that's kind of like their marketing is all generally that. They almost never in there any of the meetup marketing ever show a bunch of people sitting around playing like a board game. You know what I mean? It's like very rare. Right. Um, and that thing. It's going and kayaking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. really your, your pieces will get totally wet if you take them kayaking. So that's not going to work <laughs> out. So um, that is problem number one with meetup. And the other problem is that we've, we got from a lot of people too, is that the cost on meetup is really surprisingly high and is based off of like the number of members and all that kind of stuff and everything. So um, like our, our groups and clubs are free uh, if you have up to 10 people. Uh, right now, actually, you can add more than 10 people and they'll be grandfathered in once we, once we do the subscription thing. But when we do that for, um, the, uh, for groups and clubs, you'll still have the free ability for up to 10 people, but then beyond that, there will be a cost, <laughs> a, a pretty inexpensive cost. And it's, I think, a third of what it is for Meetup, but it's very specific. And the upside to becoming a subscribed club is that when you post your events, they will show up in the regular event group like area of where the different gaming events are. And then that will help you with recruitment. If you want to get more people in your board gaming club, um, if you have to have people go to the clubs and groups section, look for local clubs and groups, and then see what events you have, that's fine. And that's what the freebies will get. But the benefit was that, is that groups and clubs, if they're a paying group and club, will be able to post an event and choose if they want it to go into the regular event feed. And then people who don't even know about that group and club will be able to find the event. And then that will help, you know, again, help with adoption and recruitment and all that kind of stuff. So as the app works right now, Basically, everything that's in it is going to stay free forever. Um, the subscription models that we're going to start um, kicking in later part of the summer and things like that for stores, for users, and for groups and clubs, um, those will be basically all giving you nice-to-haves and add-ons and things like that. Um, we're also going to be putting some advertising in here and there. Uh, we're going to have the standard, normal, you know, 
Google ad at the bottom. If you are, as a user, become a subscriber, then that ad will disappear. But we're also looking to work with a bunch of publishers within gaming, and we've been reached out to by a bunch already, actually. Um, we're we're going to put ads kind of in between the event cards, and they will be for specific, like if you've got the filter turned off for CCGs, well, then we're not going to show you a magic ad. You know what I mean? So they'll now they'll also be directed ads. Um, stores will be able to advertise within radius of where they are, so a store doesn't you know run an ad in California when they're in Maine or whatever. Um, so those kind of things you know will be there, and and that's you know how we're looking at obviously keeping the, the lights on and the and the servers running and stuff like that. Um, I mean we are, you know we're we're funding all of this ourselves because also while we're doing all this, we're also doing our normal you know, day job, which is building websites and, and uh, apps for normal companies, insurance companies and, and, and uh, manufacturers and things like that. Um, and that's what's helped to bankroll this. This is why we didn't do a Kickstarter or anything along those lines, because we kind of also didn't want to go down that road in that mm -hmm. situation. And we found that we were lucky enough we didn't have to. So um, that's been a big benefit as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I mean, I think that that it's it's a good and it's I like that you you've been very transparent with that sort of element of it, right? Because yeah, yeah I think it's fair. Like you're saying, hey, pull it down now. What you see in the experience you have, you're going to get to keep that. That's not going away. Yep. The app's free. Uh, game for, by the way, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but G A M E F O R. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm looking for a game for the, you know, sure insert or game name here. I'm, I'm game for whatever, you know, that kind of sort of thing is basically where it, I think we're sort of started from, but yeah. Um, and the website is I am, I, A, A, I, A, M game for, so it's I am game com, And, um, we've got the information there for people to, um, find out a little bit more about the app. We've got direct links to the Android store and the iOS store. Cause it's on both. Um, we develop it separately. We, we, we do all of the, programming natively so that we the the ios version looks like an ios version and the android version looks like an android version we didn't use there's a lot of solutions out there for do it once and then output it to both systems and they don't always work super well so that's why we've decided to keep the 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 event or the um features in parity between the two pieces of software basically but they are technically different setups and uh, and that there's a benefit for that because it just makes it more um, familiar for each type of user, whether you're an iOS or an Android user. So um, we're that's that's what we do with all of our you know stuff for our normal day job stuff. So it's, it was easy enough for us to be able to do it. And we focused a lot on user experience. We focused a lot on uh, back end so that things run quickly and, and, and that kind of stuff. And we've been keeping a very, very close eye on server loads and things like that, especially when like, you know, like we did the independent characters podcast. Uh, I did that. I did an interview on that a couple of weeks ago. And then we saw kind of a spike there. Obviously the article yesterday from Geek and Sundry we saw a big spike all day yesterday and we're constantly keeping an eye on all that stuff. And the, the feedback that we're getting from people is like, Hey, this is easy to use. Hey, this is, um, you know, um, quick it's responsive that kind of stuff so that's that's been really good because that's what we're focusing on yeah yeah absolutely i think it's it's amazingly intuitive and and the thing about the ads like you mentioned like the what i what i like with the entire premise of that like the cards in between mm -hmm. is that they're actually meant to be useful i don't think any of us have a problem with ads that are actually for things we might like like exactly. that is to say, if I've been on Amazon and it said, and it's actually given me something that I've been interested in, I've actually found things on Amazon. Like when I'm banging out hobby products and pulling up new stuff, once in a while it'll show me a new hobby product. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'll check that out. Yeah. What we hate is ads that are noise. Yeah. Right. And so, like, you're trying to increase the signal to noise ratio where it's yeah. not just like dumb crap that's thrown up there that nobody cares about. That's what's annoying. Well, and that's also right. the trick, too, that we've got over a lot of, I mean, even like if you go as a publisher to a gaming specific site, you know, like, let's say you're going to advertise on um, uh, Board Game Geek, you know, you can assume that mostly people there are going there because they're board gamers. And that's kind of, that's fine. So you, you do see a lot of ads for that. But the fact that you can go and say, look, I, I only want this to be seen by people who are interested in war gaming. And the fact that we can tell that by just basically a, what filter they're using. We're, that's going to help a lot. Um, and, but also, and again, like I said, like the radius, you know, if you're trying to advertise an event, like 
beyond just putting it in the app, if you had like a big tournament, like if Adepticon or somebody wanted to do some advertising and they wanted to hit people who were into wargaming and lived within 300 miles of Chicago just to catch kind of like the people who were still on the fence, obviously, or that kind of stuff. Um, those types of opportunities are not out there. Like you can do directed advertising with Facebook, but it's not really directed within our genre. It's not bespoke. Right. Like you were talking right. about before. That's the issue. The other issue with that we have with Facebook, and I've talked to, I don't know how many gamers, I've talked to tons of gamers now who've been saying, I wouldn't even be on Facebook if it wasn't for my two gaming groups that I try to keep up with. I would just get rid of it altogether because I don't like, you know, there's people who are just like, I don't want to hear from my, you know, racist uncle on Facebook anymore. I don't want to do. And there's a lot of reasons why people don't like to be on Facebook sometimes. And I've also had people when I started the Paint Showcase Club on Facebook, um, I had people reach out to me and say, hey, can you make this group private because I want to post pictures, but I don't want my friends and family to know that I'm posting pictures of miniatures because I don't want to have to explain to Aunt, you know, Milda what those little people are and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I, the, the fact that you can kind of keep it within your life, like this is the gaming stuff. And I look at that app and I find some events. I'm like, yep, I'm going to go to that on Saturday. Cool. Great. And then you go on with the rest of your day versus just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling through Facebook over and over again. That's kind of a big thing that we really wanted to push. So. Right. Yep. Nope. Makes total sense. Uh, all right. So I think we are, we're, we've more or less probably gotten to our time here, but, uh, but is there any final thoughts you want to give any final ideas on it? Obviously we're going to throw the links down below in the description for everything. So you can go down there, we'll throw it on the link for I am game Four as well as everything else. So you can go hit that up, mm -hmm. but, uh, anything else you want to hit on or, or leave the audience with? Um, I, you know, the, the one thing that we do hear from people the most is like, Hey, this seems like a really great idea. And we, I really like the way the app works. I just, there's like, there's nobody around me yet, or there, I wish there's more people in it. And we understand that. Um, you know, again, like I said, it's just been four months since we launched and we really just very quietly kicked the tires for like the first month and a half. So we didn't really tell much people about it. I think I mentioned it on my live show a couple of times and that was about it. Um, if you're you're interested and you think this is cool, talk to your local store and say, "Hey, did you get, did you know about this?" Um, and I think it would be a good idea. Or just let them know and let them know it's free. They can get signed up for free. That kind of stuff. Tell your gaming friends. Tell your gaming group. Um, if you've got a gaming group, you can come use our interface and keep track of your events and the people and all that kind of stuff. You um, know, in a, in, a, in a way that's I think a little bit cleaner um, and easier than than some of the others. But uh, yeah, we just. We're, we're in it for the long haul. We just need to be able to spread it around more. And, you know, like I said, we just started, but we've also got patience. But, you know, if you can get out there and, and, and help us out, and if you think it's a good idea, absolutely share it, and, and that'd be great. 100%. Talk to your game stores, talk to your TOs, talk to your buddies. Let's get the word out there because exactly the more it rolls, there's a, there's a sort of snowball virtuous mm -hmm. circle effect here, right? And so, and to me, that, that store owner talking to your store owners, talking to your TOs, that's the key. Because once you get those people there, it, it creates a magnet. That's the word I've been really looking for, right? They themselves are just a magnet that attracts the other things in there and creates that critical mass really effectively. So uh, I am super excited to be sharing it, obviously. Uh, and I'm excited to, that uh, you guys are doing this. And I, I, can't, uh, I can't praise it enough. So there you go. Adam, I appreciate you coming on and talking about it, man. It's always fun to hang out. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> and I will look forward to seeing lots of events around me pop up soon on 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 there and around uh, around all of you. But uh, as for everyone, thank you very much for watching. Appreciate it. Sorry again for the late start. Blame me. It wasn't Tom. Once again, we'll, we'll close the show with that as well. But uh, thank you all for watching. As usual, it's greatly appreciated. And as always. We'll see you next Wednesday.